Good afternoon. It's 10 minutes past the top of the hour. This is KTN Business Today, your authoritative business channel across the region. Today we'll be discussing matters to do with marine insurance. What do you know about marine insurance? Well, we'll be telling you a little bit more about this. We have with us in studio James Wambugu, who is the Group Managing Director for UAP Old Mutual. will be speaking to us just really what marine insurance is all about and how are companies preparing themselves to take on this new line of insurance that has been legislated and became effective from the 1st of January. And we're asking you in our tweetable question this afternoon, do you think marine insurance will affect the cost of imported goods? Do you think marine insurance will affect the cost of imported goods? Feel free to share with us your feedback using our Twitter handle at KT News, or you can tweet me directly at Agina Abi. Remember to use the hashtag business today and we'll be able to sample some of your views and what you think really about marine insurance. Well, let's now keep you updated on some of the developing stories that we've been keeping an eye on. And the vetting of candidates nominated for appointment to the Independent and Electoral Boundaries Commission started this morning amid questions from political quarters regarding some of the nominations, including that of the chair, Wafula Chebukati, who is seeking to succeed Isaac Hassan as the chairman, was the first to face the National Assembly's Justice and Legal Affairs Committee, chaired by Samuel Chipkonga. Questions have been raised about Chebukati's appropriateness for the position following reports that other candidates performed better than he did in interviews conducted by the IBC selection panel. I was captain and chairman of Mombasa Golf Club and uh, Nyali Golf Club. At uh, the moment, I'm a director of uh, Royal Nairobi Golf Club. So issues of corporate governance, I'm very familiar with them and managing boards. I know the IBC uh, will have six commissioners who will be vetted before you. If we are all approved, I should be in a position to manage the board, give a leadership role to the organization, be able to run uh, the, the, the necessary board meetings and uh, evaluations. So I, I have that experience in terms of uh, leadership. As to what I'll do, differently uh, uh, that's the uh, the question uh, chair you have asked uh, i'm aware that uh, ibcs are going concerned there are things happening the secretariat is there it has been working uh, very hard and uh, yes we when we go in there if you approve us and my commission has to go in we, we shall pick it up from where it is. I know next week the voter registration exercise kicks off. That will be priority, number one. Go for it, get the voter register cleaned up. And uh, because it's a sensitive issue, the voter register, we shall have it cleaned up. And then uh, once it's cleaned up, it will, under my leadership, it will be hushed so that it's not uh, tampered with. We're also looking at the area of uh, what I will do after the voter register is to look. We, are, we have uh, the system of electronic system being purchased. I, I saw in the newspapers that the tender has been stopped. But at some stage, it has to be purchased. Now, this is a new system. Going by what we went through in 2013, we don't want a situation where this system fails in the middle of elections. So my take is that once it's purchased, it's commissioned, uh, before elections, uh, we should be able to do proper tests on the system. The old penetration tests need to be done to make sure it is secure from hackers, because uh, you'll appreciate here the people out there would want to hack in the system. So those tests need to be done uh, to make sure it's not hacked. We also, I would also, go for the idea of checking the load, make sure it doesn't crash in the middle of elections. And uh, load testing is very, very important. Uh, how, how is that done? That can be done by way of stimulation, uh, test. Uh, you can, uh, <coughs> under my leadership, I'll make sure we run two, three trial uh, elections before then. 
Indeed, that was earlier on when one of the nominees was being interviewed by the Justice and Legal Affairs Committee, which we expect the interviews to continue to tomorrow. And to some business stories now, brace yourselves for even tougher economic times ahead as raised political temperatures and ongoing drought and rising global petroleum prices all conspire to take a toll on the Kenyan economy. According to a review from Stanbic Bank Kenya, all these factors will see the Kenya shilling take a beating in 2017, though a standby facility from the IMF coupled with a timely intervention from the central bank should stem any slide in the currency. Uh, happy New Year. According to Stanbic Bank Regional Economist Gibran Kureishi, the epicenter of concern for the headline of inflation has been and still remains food prices after poor rains in the last quarter of 2016, which is expected to weigh negatively on agriculture in the new year. Between now and April, we'll see headline inflation going up. I think it will be a function of not just food prices going up, it will also be a function of uh, unwinding base effects. Further afield, a growth in global demand for oil and production cuts by major producers have seen crude oil prices crossing the $58 per barrel mark a few days ago. And despite oil producer body OPEC seeking ways to soften the blow, experts still predict average international oil prices to be higher in 2017, widening the current account deficit to around 6.7% of the GDP from the previous estimate of 5.8%. Uh, many might say that this cut in production will take oil prices back up to the level of the go go years that we've seen. But we don't share that. Being an election year for Kenya, which automatically comes with uncertainties, the Kenyan economy is expected to slow down, which will lead to slow pace of economic activities. However, projections reveal that the Kenyan shillings may not see a decline with potential external loans and the IMF facility acting as adequate buffers. Regardless of this, there's an urgent need to boost national savings. I think for us to actually you know, sit here and say that the currency is going to weaken solely because it's an election year is quite simplistic. Stanbic have predicted the GDP growth will shrink 5.4% in 2017 from an estimated 5.7% in 2016, arguably due to a slowdown in private sector credit growth. But since historically Kenya's GDP has been lower in election years, it remains to be seen whether there will be a similar outcome this year. Ashley Mazuri, KTN News. As part of its Operation Pride turnaround strategy, Kenya Airways is set to render 38 of its staff redundant as the national carrier resizes its business. Operation Pride affected early last year, so 80 staff affected by the restructuring process that seeks to save the airline over 200 million shillings and raise efficiency gains. In what it terms right-sizing, 38 employees will be affected by the second phase of Kenya Airways Operation Pride exercise. A statement received by KTN News indicates the airline continues to look for opportunities for productivity and efficiency gains that are in line with its goals of closing the profitability gap, refocusing the business model, as well as optimizing the capital structure of the company. Kenya Airways, that narrowed its pre-tax losses for the first half of the financial year 2016-2017, attributed its narrowed losses to reduction and sublease of its fleet of aircraft, reduction of waste in catering, and renegotiation of contracts in line with the current fiscal realities. In February of 2016, national carrier Kenya Airways appointed PJT Partners as the airline's transaction advisor on its balance sheet restructure and long-term capital refinancing as part of its turnaround strategy. In July of 2016, the airline rendered 80 of its staff redundant in what it argued would deliver over $200 million of value in various initiatives, half of which focused on increase in revenue and other half on cost reduction. Joy Dorin Bira. KTN News. Let's shift focus now to Western Kenya, where pan paper uh, actually concerns are being raised over the recent revival of the Webuye based rye paper mills. Local leaders and residents claim there are no signs of life at the factory despite the recent high profile relaunch by President Uhuru Kenyatta. 
It's almost one month since the president visited Pine Pepper, the collapsed paper farm now renamed Rye Pepper Mills. It was joy for the locals as the president's endorage, comprising of deputy president, cabinet secretaries and local leaders reopened the paper farm with a promise that it would readily create 500 jobs during the first phase. The farm collapsed way back in 2008. Nikawapatia mwaka moja, nikawambia tungependa kurudi hapa, kuona hii factory ikifanya kazi na ikiandika vijana wetu wa hapa webui. But since reopening one month ago, there are no signs of activity here or any hope of the pant paper reviving. The state of affairs here is casting a dark cloud over the much hyped revival. Mimi nilikuwa mmoja wa wale ambapo waliita kasi kule pant paper webui. Na tulishtuka sana kwa sababu wakati file tulifika e, tulikuta mambo imepatilika. Na wakasema sisi tuwe e, turuti tu nyumbani etu watatuita. Na akatuambia ya kwamba anaenda kuandika kazi na halikuamba hiyo mashini naenza kufanya kazi. Lakini mbaka wa leo tangu aingie pale afungue kiwanda. Hadujaona maendeleo yoyote, hadujaona hata mashini yenyewe ikitoa moshi. And as local leaders mainly from the opposition have seized the opportunity to put the government in a corner over promises that the paper farm would be operational. Mimi nilikuwa juzi webuye nikatembea huko pani paper kumefungwa hata uwezi kuingia. Sasa hiyo ni factory gani nafanya kazi na imefungwa. Sasa sijui kama uh, president alikuja kufungua ama kufunga. Hangati argues that Pan Paper is now a private entity and questioned the move by the president to commission it. Hmm? Kwa maana tunasikia tena, hiyo mradi hata si ya serikali ni ya mtu binafsi. Na mradi ya mtu binafsi uwezi kumlazimisha uh, ataanza kufanya kazi lini. But the new investor Jaswand Rai says, contrary to fears raised by the leaders as well as residents, the revival of Rai paper mills is still on course and that several other phases are to be commissioned soon. See, today, fundamentally, the president is coming to uh, uh, inaugurate the first line of the, out of the four lines we have at uh, the factory. Uh, we managed to rehabilitate uh, one line. Uh, which uh, you will see it uh, running uh, as we go around. Uh, the fundamental reason is that uh, machine number four we were able to rehabilitate uh, in the last uh, five, six months. And as the country gears for the coming general election late in August, the pan paper revival politics is bound to take center stage in Western Kenya politics. What began as the story of hope that was the reopening of Pan Paper Mills, now renamed Rye Paper Mills in Webuye, is first turning into another story of despair as residents and former workers now call for more action at the paper farm. Robert Wanyonyi, KTN News. Many thanks there, Robert. And small and medium-sized companies are set to benefit from additional lending from the European Investment Bank. The bank is looking to disperse about 87 billion shillings of new lending to East Africa's to East Africa clear this year. The EIB is looking to sink about 10.5 billion shillings financial support to regional private sector investments in Africa in 2017. Kenyan entrepreneurs will access the EIB-backed loans directly from local banks. The Luxembourg-based lender says the fund is likely to give priority support to agricultural investments in Kenya in a bid to promote food security and create jobs. The EIB is the world's largest international public bank. The long-term lending institution has supported investment across Africa for more than 50 years, giving more than 22 billion euros across the continent. The International Finance Corporation, which is the World Bank's private sector lending arm, estimates that uh, 
SMEs in Kenya have an annual credit gap of over $6 billion, approximately 630 billion shillings, which affects their ability to compete with bigger businesses. Indeed, interesting developments around the SME world. And now to Mombasa. Away from the heated up politics following ongoing Mombasa projects, residents can now have a sigh of relief following the unveiling of the first ever footbridge put up along the busy Sheikh Abdullah Ali Farsi Road at the Buckstone stage. According to the managing director of Hasil Construction, Abdi Nasir Yusuf, the recently commissioned bridge is set to enhance mobility and access to social amenities such as schools, clinics and hospitals. The footbridge comes with a headroom of 6.2 meters and is 36 meters long made of imported structural steel imported from China manufactured with key considerations of Mombasa's atmospheric conditions to avoid rust with works starting from ground excavation up to coral base to ensure 100 percent firmness of the entire structure. Apart from the footbridges, the project that involves erection of non-motorized traffic facilities, other projects include footpaths, cycle tracks, and installation of other associated support facilities like speed calming features and road furniture. One Congoya and another one is Coastal General. We are waiting still from county government to give us that side go ahead. Kuna watu wengi wamegonga wakivuka hii barabara. Marafiki zangu wawili nimewapoteza hapa hapa. Sasa hii naona italeta usalama kwenye barabara na tunashukuru sana serikali. Hapo kwanza tuna kama hospitali, kuna watu kama wagonjwa. Alafu kulingana na situation ya hapa magari ni mengi. We can't expect a patient afuke barabara. It can cause an accident. So the bridge imeokoa sana. Well, aside from developments in Mombasa, there is another development right here in the capital, and that is the marine insurance fever. As different insurance companies rush to start rolling out projects and uh, the product actually in the market, this follows um, the government uh, passing legislation that requires insurance companies to procure marine insurance locally. And we want now to speak to James Wambugu, the group managing director for UAP Old Mutual, which is one of the companies that is in this line of business. But first, let's demystify for you what is marine cargo insurance. Well, as you can see on the screens there, marine cargo insurance policy provides indemnity against loss or damage for goods being transported by sea or air and incidental land transportation. This is according a uh, definition according to the United Nations um, ANCTA, that is. And um, just looking at the broader picture, we are seeing um, world merchandise trade globally is standing at uh, um, grew actually in 2015 by 1.4%, whereas trade volumes globally were subdued. 13% linked to fluctuations in commodity prices. This basically shows you a picture of what marine insurance is all about and the global perspectives. Let me now bring in James Wambugu. Thank you for making time to be with us this afternoon. Um, of course, uh, we are seeing a lot of companies now rolling out this product. Perhaps um, from UAP or Mutual, um, are you ready to take on this product in the market? Well, certainly we are always ready because that's the business we are in. Um, we have been doing marine insurance uh, for a very long time. Uh, we've been in the Kenyan market for more than 80 years. I have to actually say that the extension of marine insurance from the, from the seaports to inland was actually an innovation done by our predecessor company, which was called a provincial company in the UK. Yeah. Uh, so we, we it really, uh, when it comes to marine, we've been a, a key player. Uh, a few years ago, we were actually the leader in uh, marine insurance uh, until a lot of uh, some of the big uh, um, uh, Kangol uh, importers yeah. started moving out of Kenya and started procuring this uh, insurance overseas. Mm -hmm. And therefore, some of that business then uh, dried up and uh, uh, we haven't seen much growth in that particular mm -hmm. class of business. So. We, 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 our license allows us to do marine insurance. Uh, we have the skills that, uh, that, are, that are needed because this is also very important. You have to have people who understand. I believe we have one of the best marine and writers in the country. Uh, and number two, uh, we also need to have financial strength. 
um, some of the big uh, importers, their biggest concern was that um, do we have enough capacity? In fact, I was coming to that question. Yes. <coughs> and this has been an ongoing concern that um, the local companies might not have the financial muscle to take on some of these uh, big companies that are in the shipping business that, um, like you've seen in the previous slides where you're seeing uh, global um, trade in terms of uh, marine cargo grew by 1.4%, and this translates to billions of tons, if I may say so. Yes, uh, you know, uh, people who say that the local insurance industry doesn't have capacity lack an understanding of how insurance works because in, there's no particular country that can say they can take care of everything. What tends to happen is that first of all you have our own balance sheet and when I talk about our own balance sheet I'm not just talking about UAP or Mucho, I'm yeah. talking about the entire balance sheet of the industry because if there's one risk that is too big to be taken by one company, it's actually supposed to be taken by the other companies until it is exhausted, and there are protocols of doing that. However, I have to say that the size of cargoes and the size of marine imports that we have in this country, UAP Old Mucho alone is capable of handling any of those uh, uh, imports. So based on, uh, on our balance sheet and based on what you call reinsurance, because what tends to happen yeah. is that um, uh, no insurance company takes everything, uh, all there is to their, to their balance sheet. Through an insurance, uh, reinsurance program, which is normally uh, reviewed and approved by the independent regulator, uh, you are able then to actually make sure that uh, some of the risk that you get then gets uh, uh, you know, passed on to the reinsurer. Uh, and that reinsurer himself will have passed it on to many other people. It is even possible that some of the people who are insuring uh, overseas, some of that uh, uh, premium actually ends up, finds its way back in Kenya, for example, through our own reinsurers here like Kenya Re and, and Africa Re. Mm -hmm. So we, we have the skills and we have the financial capability to underwrite any risk that, uh, that is in this country despite the fact that uh, right. the size of uh, cargoes are growing in value. Mm -hmm. All right. And uh, that aside, Mr. Ambugu, um, just explain to the average Kenyan now, how will this new requirement perhaps impact the cost of goods? That's actually one of our questions we are putting to our viewers. We're asking them, uh, do they f feel that um, the introduction of um, marine insurance to be procured locally will be translated to the goods at the shop? Uh, thank you very much. Number one, I think people need to know that up to, even today, before you import goods here, normally they are insured. Uh, number two, the rates that are applied by the foreign insurers are basically largely the same rates that we apply in, in, in the Kenyan market. Why is that the case? The, we all go to the same reinsurers, and those reinsurers dictate the pricing of this uh, international product. So the same insurers from whom we buy the insurance are the same ones the other foreign companies uh, that have been insuring this risk have been getting, uh, getting from. So I can say confidently that um, the, uh, the, 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 there should be, should be no change in the pricing or in the rate or in the premium that importers have been paying to the foreign insurance companies. In fact, because of how competitive our insurance industry in Kenya is, you could actually end up finding that people might start making some, uh, some, uh, some savings so, um, and, and in the event that, uh, that those savings are not coming through, clearly I think the customers have a right to actually demand that there is no reason, even though that it is necessary that we ensure these things locally, mm -hmm. that sh they should not necessarily have to pay more because this business has been brought to the Kenyan insurers. Interesting. Perhaps um, what do you see in the horizon now that this um, law becomes, uh, became effective 1st of January, how do we expect this to impact uh, insurance companies moving forward? I think number one, uh, it's, it's certainly going to grow our total premiums in the industry. Uh, estimates have been given that uh, if you just apply a reasonable rate of marine insurance premium on the total uh, value of goods imported into Kenya, the total size of the business should be around 20 billion Kenya shillings. Uh, currently, we're only writing 2.5 billion. So you can imagine an injection of an additional 17.5 billion mm -hmm. into the insurance industry. That's a significant boost. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, the class of marine is also generally more profitable than uh, 
than they, than they see motor class. So mm -hmm. therefore, also the bottom line of a number of companies are going to is going to improve. Not every company in Kenya actually underwrites marine. So you can end up finding that um, maybe a lot of this business will be shared among maybe top mm -hmm. uh, ten insurance companies, which right. therefore means a significant. Uh, increase in the in the revenues for each of those companies and of course the bottom line which means a stronger insurance company but okay. i think more importantly if you allow me to just put this point across we are saving this country also foreign currency because every time we pay premiums for marine cargo for goods we are ourselves importing we are actually sending out our own foreign currency and we are also taking away some jobs to those foreign countries and as well taking some of our own income as a nation to those countries Many thanks there, James Wambogo, Group Managing Director, UP Old Mutual. Just uh, giving us perspectives around marine insurance. Of course, uh, he is pointing to the fact that uh, better times ahead for insurance companies that have the license to insure marine insurance. We will be having that conversation um, in a short while with another gentleman who will be joining us, and that is Daniel Kiange, the manager of trade facilitation at the Kenya Trade Network, which is one of the key implementing agencies. He'll be sharing with us some of the logistical issues around why this approach by the government at this day and time.